Hello, mathematicians. My name is Matt DeSorbo, covering the algebra lessons for Skew the Script. Today, we'll be discussing regression and prediction, specifically in the context of predictions made by companies in the modern business landscape and their ethical implications. Without further ado, let's skew it. Welcome into lesson 2.3 of our Skew the Script algebra series today detailing linear regression and prediction. You've probably heard of these companies. They all use some form of prediction, algorithms, regression for a variety of their business practices. However, sometimes these can be controversial and various articles have been written about how different algorithms can threaten democracy, can be harmful to society in general. So today's key analysis centers around when and why uh, mathematical predictions and algorithms can potentially be unethical. If you'd like to follow along with our discussion, check out the link below, print or download the guided notes and work through it as we talk about linear regression and prediction. We'll start by discussing the line of best fit. Specifically, in a real world context, we'll be talking about your credit score, which is a number that tracks how quickly and consistently you pay off debt. So debt on loans, uh, your house, credit cards, uh, et cetera. One example is paying a house loan or a mortgage on time. So you take out money from the bank um, and pay it uh, a little by little over time to pay off that loan. Um, if you do so, the mortgage company will file a good report and your credit score, score will grow. Um, if you miss a payment on your car loan though, for example, um, the car company will file a bad report and your credit score will decline. Uh, this all feeds into something called a loan approval. So uh, loan companies want to use credit scores to predict future payments. They'll collect data on customers' credit scores and the percent of their loan they pay off within three months. We have an example, a uh, random data set on the left side. So there's the credit score of the individual and then the percent of loan paid off in the right column. Um, again, this is really important because Loan companies want to use these scores to predict future payments. Obviously, that's the main topic of our discussion. Um, in this case, the credit score is the explanatory variable and the percent paid off is the response variable. Um, written again here as our X and Y uh, variables. So again, a good way to remember is X, EX matches to the X variable. Um, you can also think of this as the independent and dependent variables. Here's a chart of the data uh, we saw in the previous slide. So credit score on the x-axis, percent of loan paid off on the y-axis. Uh, it seems to be a positive trend. So as credit scores increase, the percent of loan paid tends to rise. Um, and we'll discuss positive and negative trends more in our next lesson. So bear with us here. Uh, we'll get more detailed in a future section. Um, so one example here, something to think about is a person with a credit score of 700 applies for a loan. What percent of their loan will we predict them to pay off within three months? Um, we can model the trend in our data. And what's really interesting, we can use this model to make predictions about someone applying for a loan. So let's consider model one. We take our data and we draw this uh, black line through all of the data points. Is this a good model? In fact, this is not a good model. Instead of capturing the overall trend, it just draws and connects the dots on our chart. It very much overfits the specific individuals in our data set. It's pretty bad for making predictions on new data since we just are drawing lines, uh, connecting dots given the data that we currently have. Real data will often have more random uh, variation between individuals. So we have to model the trend, not the exact random variation. Um, when we have real data, don't just connect the dots. A better model is something that's called the line of best fit, which we've drawn here uh, with the, the black line. And the way you can think of this is a linear model that roughly puts half the data above the line and half the data below the line. Um, it models the trend, not the specific random uh, variations of individuals. So it's pretty good for making predictions. Um, you're gonna learn more about constructing uh, the line of best fit in a statistics class. This is an algebra series, um, but it's, it's we, we're introducing kind of the concept now, but for, for more details, you're, you'll learn about that later on. Um, we can now turn to our slope and y-intercept. Um, obviously before making predictions, we actually have to mathematically define what model uh, we are using to make those predictions. And for that, we can turn to every mathematician's favorite one-liner, y equals mx plus b. Um, in this case, we have y equals 2x plus 1, and we've charted that uh, line on the left. We have two questions here, slope, and what does it mean, and y-intercept, what does it mean? First, for the slope, we see uh, 2 is our m in y equals 2x plus 1, um, and that means that for every uh, increase in x of 1, our increase in y on our line and our function is 2. So 
Uh, again, we have it written here for every increase in X by one unit, the Y value increases by the slope of two. The Y intercept on the other hand is this red number uh, that's equivalent to B and Y equals MX plus B. And that means uh, when X equals zero, the Y value is one, which you can see on the red dot on the chart on the left. So we're gonna use Y equals MX plus B to describe our line of best fit. We do have one small change. Instead of Y, you're gonna see this green uh, Y hat uh, with a little hat over it. That means the predicted Y value, since we're modeling predictions, not connecting the actual dots, the actual uh, data. So here is our line of best fit, Y hat equals MX plus B. Um, in this case, we actually have our values for our line of best fit, Y equals 0.074X plus 26.8. That is our, in this case, specific line of best fit. So let's start by interpreting the slope value. And remember the slope is that MX va M value in MX plus B, so 0 0.074. Um, and again, remember that uh, the slope indicates for every increase in X by one unit, how much the uh, Y values increase. So in this case, uh, we can uh, interpret for every one unit increase in X, we predict a 0 0.074 change or increase in Y. Um, in there are specific problem, uh, we're using X as our credit score and Y as the percent of loan paid. So taking this a step further, and our final answer here is for every one point increase in credit score X, our model predicts a 0.074 percentage point increase in the loan amount paid off within three months. So a pretty useful uh, uh, tool there. Uh, second, we can inter inter interpret the y-intercept. Uh, here it's 26.8 or the b in y equals mx plus b. Um, again, if we return to our chart, that red dot is uh, the y-intercept is when x equals zero, whatever the y value is. So here, um, when x equals zero, y is predicted to be 26.8. Again, x is our credit score and y is the percent of loan paid off. Um, so our answer here, the interpretation is for people with a credit score of zero, our model predicts they will pay off 26.8% of their loan amount within three months. However, in this case, the y-intercept value is not meaningful since a credit score of zero is impossible. Uh, the lowest is 300. So in this case, like many others, the y-intercept value actually um, specifically doesn't matter as much on its own. Um, finally, let's turn to actually using our model to make predictions. So let's say a person with a credit score of 700 applies for a loan. What percent of their loan do you predict they'll pay off within three months? This is the question we saw earlier, but now we have the tools to actually solve it. Um, so again, I return to our simple example of y equals 2x plus 1. Um, we can find the y value when x equals 2, and that's as simple as taking our original equation um, and looking on our chart where x equals 2, that's the vertical green line, plugging in x equals 2 to our equation, we get 2 times 2 plus 1, y equals 5. And you can see on our chart on the left um, that uh, checks out y is 5 uh, when x equals 2 on our line. So returning to our actual credit score question, some of the credit score of 700 applies to a loan. We take our model uh, y hat, our predicted y uh, equals 0.074x plus 26.8. We plug in set x equals 700, multiply 700 by 0 0.074, add 26.8, and we get y equals 78.6% of their loan. So um, our prediction in that case was that they'll pay off 78.6% of their loan in three months. And now let's turn to the next question where your boss says, I want to only give loans to people who will usually pay at least 80% of the loan within three months. What credit scores should I accept? This is a different type of problem, but we can still answer it with our uh, linear model. In this case, we have Y hat again, um, and the, the slope and Y intercept we saw before. Um, let, in this case, instead of working with our X value, set our Y hat value to 80, since our boss only wants to accept people um, with 80% or higher. So we set Y equal to 80. Um, we are solving for X because we don't know what that value is. So we subtract both sides by 26.8. We divide, we get 53.2 equals 0 0.074X, divide by 0 0.074, and we get X is about 719. So if we only accept credit scores of 719 or higher, those are the individuals that our model predicts will pay at least 80% of their loan within three months. So another way to use our linear model. Finally, let's turn to the topic we started with, which is prediction ethics. Um, so returning to the algorithms, large companies use all sorts of data to build algorithms that make predictions. These models are definitely more complicated than the ones we just discussed with the credit score, but the basic idea is the same as what we just did, making predictions about people using input data. 
And kind of the next discussion point is, what are the ethical considerations of these algorithms? So one major question is asking if the algorithm is biased. So imagine your, your company adopting this following policy. All applicants with credit scores above the threshold you determined earlier are automatically approved, whereas all applicants below are automatically denied. So again, um, you know, we're looking at uh, this, this chart from earlier where we only, we automatically accept individuals with 719 or higher, reject those with, seven, with lower than 719. In this case, we consider no other variables and approval, is deni approval or denial is only determined by credit score. Um, however, a month later, an independent audit finds that the company accepts white and Asian people's loan applications at higher rates than those from Black and Hispanic applicants. Is your company's algorithm biased? So with this in mind, let's turn to our discussion uh, for this section. Um, looking at our data, kind of from the, the audit that we discussed earlier, is our data biased? We have the group and then the percent of bad credit or no credit. And then uh, this is essentially our credit scores by racial group. Bad credit here um, means a credit score below uh, 640. You can see as highlighted in the table, black and Hispanic citizens tend to have bad or no credit more frequently uh, than the other groups. Um, and again, we can ask the question if our data is biased. So credit scores reward on-time payments to homes, college loans, and cars. Um, it can, and the key uh, factor here is that it requires these payments consistently and over long periods of time. So we can uh, look to a couple of different arguments in the field to um, kind of set the discussion going. One example is Frederick Wary, a professor at Princeton, who argues that historical discrimination in home loans have prevented people of color from establishing generational wealth and long lines of credit. Um, therefore, the lack of credit history and inherited wealth has effects on modern day credit scores. Um, one example is how many people of color are unable to buy a house, so they start renting. Um, and unlike mortgages, which you get when you buy a house, on-time rent payments often don't help the credit score. So this has a negative impact on building a credit score over time. Another example is middle, fat, middle class families uh, accruing and passing down wealth through home ownership, and the next generation can then use this inherited wealth to establish good credit, but um, people of color often don't have the same opportunity due to the aforementioned lack of prior home ownership. Um, so that's kind of, that's, that's Frederick Wary's stance. Uh, there's also a personal preference argument. Um, in surveys, Black and Hispanic consumers were three to four times more likely to prefer cash for regular expenses, that's over credit cards, whereas Asian and white consumers uh, tended to prefer credit cards over cash. And as we kind of alluded to, credit cards help to establish long-term credit histories and therefore lead to higher credit scores. Um, so the preference for credit cards uh, boosts white and Asian credit scores on average. Of course, there are um, other, other uh, out, uh, examples. Um, so the, the question we'll return to is, is our algorithm biased? An independent audit finds, again, that the company accepts white and Asian people's loan applications at higher rates than those from Black and Hispanic applicants. And the question here is, is your company's algorithm biased? Um, so data scientist A, uh, imagine you can imagine a data scientist making this argument. Their model only considers credit scores without considering race. It's not our job to determine if the credit scores themselves are biased. So our algorithm is not racially biased. That's the stance of data scientist A. However, data scientist B uh, takes the stance, if Professor Wary is right, credit scores may reflect biases driven by historical discrimination. So by using credit scores, our algorithm is using and reinforcing these biases. Our algorithm is racially biased. So the discussion question, which we'll turn to you, you can discuss with your classmates, which data scientist A or B makes a more compelling argument and why? If you were the boss, would you continue using this credit score algorithm and explain your answer? That's all for today on Skew the Script. We'll see you next time.